The only thing that's gonna stop you in life is you versus you. There is no way I'm gonna be able to survive here for another 25 years until I retire. It is not sustainable to work that much, but majority of Americans do it. Majority of Americans are relying on their nine to five right now, and they're working that much thinking that they're financially free. It has to work where it has to work. Welcome to an episode of Circle of Greatness today. Woo, I got something special for y'all. I want to call this man the money man, y'all. So this gentleman, man, amazing entrepreneur, former police officer. I ain't going to tell y'all his stories, but he's literally breaking down how to get into the ATM business, y'all, and Bitcoin machines, all type of stuff. And I'm excited to have him on. Like he did this before at my conference and it really helped impact a lot of lives. So we're about to get into a story and you're about to hear how you can tap into this billion dollar industry without further ado my brother paul what up bro yo yeah, welcome, what's up welcome, man welcome, welcome, welcome bro how you feeling i'm feeling good man good, it's, i mean it's good to be in atl it's yeah. it's it's a trip because when you told me you were going down to san diego yeah. i was just like yeah. man this dude is going to down to san diego right. when it's raining right <laughs> the only time when it's raining and it was pouring too bro like it started i was here i'm like is that rain and yeah. it was pouring but it's all good man how you feeling man i'm feeling good man good, how man. about yourself i'm amazing man thanks for getting on bro Give me some stats about ATMs, bro. Like, yeah. I, I know, like, is we was having a conversation earlier, and it was like, you was like, 25% of people don't have access to the banking system? I'm like, yeah, yeah. They got to use ATMs. They got, like, give me a, give me some stats that just we don't know. I don't know if you got any you want to share with me. No, absolutely. I mean, like, the, the first objection we usually get were like, man, you were able to create a multi-million dollar business off of those machines, and you, you got in, like, super late. Well, one, I got in about seven years ago while I was still a detective in law enforcement. Yeah. I was in law enforcement for seven years, uh, detective, did the whole undercover 21 Jump Street type of deal. Wow. But then um, basically ATMs was my vehicle, just like event spaces, right? It was my vehicle to basically escape my nine to five. Mm. So to go back to who basically the avatar is or who's the audience that actually uses the ATMs, a lot of people don't know that over 25% of Americans in the United States currently, they don't have access to the banking system. Yeah. So because they don't have access to the banking system, whether they're either not a uh, US citizen, uh, undocumented uh, immigrant. I mean, I come from a immigrant family. I'm Mexican and Peruvian. Uh, at the end of the day, si hablo español. And yeah. <laughs> at, at the end of the day, I know how it is. You know, I know how it is to, you know, count your cents, uh, count your dollars to go uh, get a, a bus ride. So at the end of the day, uh, ATMs, they're placed in different areas. More than likely, it's going to be low income in uh, neighborhoods, um, you know, accessible to people that need access to cash, right? That don't have access to credit cards. So it, we really have our niched down audience. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. You don't need all of the United States yeah. to use your ATM. Right. You just need a few people a day right. and hey, you're making money. Yeah, and that's powerful just to understand that. Before we, I wanna jump into the ATMs, but I think it's important to, um, how we kind of do our podcast is I really look at it as a, as a masterclass. Like yeah. you come on here, teach, how do we get in? Like kind of break, but I kind of want to hear a little bit of the backstory. I, we never really discussed the upbringing, like, I didn't know you came from nothing, so we yeah. got similar. I know, we talked about having similar backgrounds, but I didn't dig deep into that. So when did you come over to the States? Were you born here? Give me a little bit of that so people kind of understand. Yeah. A lot of times they'll look at you, they'll look at me, and I'm like, well, they would, this dude was handed everything. This dude no. was a cop. This dude's a, a, a multimillionaire, and sometimes they tap out like, well, He's special, but no, you just said you came from nothing. So I want you to kind of share that. Yeah, absolutely, man. And I love sharing this story because it's a story that I really don't speak about it anywhere. Yeah. And I've done a, a few podcasts in the past couple of years now. But um, yeah, I come from an immigrant family. My mom, she's from Lima, Peru, South America. My dad, he's from uh, Chihuahua, Mexico. They're both immigrants. They couldn't speak English. Mm -hmm. I remember my mom telling me that she came literally... Uh, snuck into the United States, uh, found a job cutting down trees. And we're talking about my mom's like a buck 20. So she's 120 pounds, yeah. small lady, Peruvian lady. Um, but she did, she was doing, you know, very physical work yeah. to be here in the States. Met my pops. My pops at the time was a construction worker. And um, they, I mean, they had me, right? So then um, they separated. 
when I was about two years old. And then my mom was a single mom. She ended up getting a job as a housekeeper working for the Four Seasons Hotel. Uh, almost reminds me of that <laughs> of that movie, uh, Made in Manhattan with Jennifer Lopez. Yeah, and then she I've ended up, she ended up uh, meeting my stepdad. He was like the banquet manager and he was also Mexican, but he, he had just transferred from New York to San Francisco where I'm originally from. Um, and they met together and then we were able to, you know, 30 years later, here we are. Right. But during that transition, um, oh man, we lived in poverty. You know, we lived in San Francisco. Uh, there'd be times where I wouldn't see my mom for like 10 to 12 hours a day. So I was literally at home by myself. Um, then, uh, my mom would come home after, you know, working late, cook dinner. And that's just the way life was. Yeah. And as I was growing up, when you don't know any better, especially in your environment, my mom was like, mijo, you got to go to school. Mm -hmm. You got to go to school. Mm -hmm. You got to get a good job. Yep. You got to go and, you know, become a doctor, become a lawyer. The standard, you yeah, know, yeah, just yeah, like any family that comes from poverty that doesn't know any better. Just go to school, get that job, uh, buy a house, live the American dream. But as I was growing up, I didn't know any better, man. I didn't know any better. And, you know, I was just trying to be liked with my friends. So I tried to, I got influenced by, you know, some, some bad kids growing up, man. So I wasn't, I wasn't like the, uh, the most straight arrow going into to school or whatnot. I didn't really have any sense of direction. And um, you could say uh, <laughs> growing up after high school, it's like majority of the kids that are going through right now, they're like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Mm -hmm. So I lived in a small town in the East Bay, out of the Bay Area in San Francisco. Um, and this small town, it probably had less than, I'm going to say, 10,000 people. Yeah. So what do you do in a small town, man? You go find a local job, mm -hmm. possibly either retail or fast food. Yeah. I mean, there's really no opportunities and your eyes are not open. So then... Um, Man, found my first job in corporate America, did corporate sales at the age of 21. I remember landing it right before I turned 21, and I was pumped, man. I was pumped. I was just like, this is it. Yep. You know, I'm going to make money. I was working on commission, and uh, it was a glorified repairman for a commercial dishwashing machine. Okay. Yeah, like for company. And I'm talking about, I went through it, man. I was 21, but I was happy. Yeah. I wore the uniform and everything. And I was fixing dish, uh, dishwashing, uh, you know, machines for, uh, <laughs> for Cheesecake Factory. Yeah. The managers would be yelling at me. But I was still happy because I was making good money at the time. At the age of 21, I was bringing in $40,000 a year. Wow. $40,000 a yeah. year. And I was happy. Yeah. I was content. I was yep. fulfilled because I wasn't exposed to And you did what your mom said. Like you went and found a good job. I found that. a good job and I was, I was building something but for, for myself. Yes. For myself. Yep. So I took a lot of pride in that, mm -hmm. right? And then at that time, I started going to school. I started going back to college. Um, I got my associate's degree in business administration. And then I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to double down on working yep. because... One, I don't want to stay home for the rest of my life. I don't want to be, you know, in my mid-20s still living with mom, mom and dad. So that, that was, I was very prideful. I needed to be independent. And that's just the way my, my mom raised me, yeah. you know, to be strong and to go get it, right? So double down on sales, um, was able to get promoted a couple of times, became a uh, corporate sales manager, had about six people under my, my team in the six years for this large company. Now it's a multi-billion dollar company, uh, chemical cleaning company, but uh, was able to buy my first condo at the age of 22. Mm. Um, was making close to six figures. I mean, I had the bands, dude. I was just, I was living life. Yeah. You know, yeah. going on vacation, self-sufficient. Uh, was in my first very serious relationship that lasted seven years at that time. Um, and then all of a sudden, I got used to it. Mm. I got content. I got comfortable with the people I was working with. Yeah. And everybody you're, at that you're time. You're still at the corporate sales job right there. At, at corporate sales job. Gotcha. And I needed something. I needed change, man. Yeah. So I was just like, what, 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 what could I do? What could I do to develop myself as a person? And I had to find myself. At that time, I was still young and dumb. I was uh, spending a lot of my money going out, you know, buying bottle service yeah. and, you know, just living we all, life. We all done that before. I mean, come yeah. on, man. You, ha you have yeah, we to all experience done that. Experience that. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, majority of the friends that I have, I mean, I'm currently 35, if they didn't experience that in their 20s, 
oh, they're going to go hard in their 30s. Right. That's just the way yeah. it is. But, and then vice versa. That's a fact. You have to learn in life. You have to go through those life experiences, okay? So anyways, man, uh, around mid-20s, I then uh, was talking to my girl at that time, and I was telling her, I was like, you know what, babe, I need, a, I need a change. She's like, why don't you become a cop? And I was just like, one, I never thought about that yeah. in my life. Yeah. I was just like. Hey, guys, mm-hmm. for the record, he's a good, he was a good cop. <laughs> <laughs> yes, guys, for the record, yeah. I, was, uh, I was a talker. So I got into basically police work, yeah. and it was because at that time my ex- had a cousin who was a sergeant of police for the local city in San Francisco. So I applied to different agencies and I ended up working for uh, Oakland, in in Oakland, for a police agency in Oakland. And I'm going to tell you something, man. (laughs) Uh, Out of academy, I mean, I was never militant. And, you know, an academy is very rigid. It's very paramilitary. So they're strict, man. With me, I just been always a smooth operator. I love to talk to people. I'm very friendly. So my communicating skills was uh, a little bit above average than the, the rest of my peers. So I would always communicate, you know, with my, my training officers and all that jazz. And they'd be like, man, Paul, you know what? We can't even get mad at you, you know, even though we want to. But, um, yeah, so they put me in the worst area in Oakland. We're talking about East yeah. Oakland. The hood. The hood, bro. Yeah. Yeah. And we're talking about, okay, I mean, I come from poverty. Yeah. I come from a low-income uh, neighborhood. Right. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but yeah. we're talking about third-world conditions in deep East Oakland. We're wow. talking about, like, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 100s. And if somebody's from, you know, the Bay Area, they know what I'm talking about. Right. And it is not nice over there, man. And it was consistent drive-bys. Consistent robberies, consistent murders. Um, I think my first three months, I had experienced about 15 different shootings I responded to um, where there was somebody shot. And I responded to three murders where I showed up and I actually saw like dead bodies. Like, yeah. you know, just recently just got shot and, you know, we're doing medical procedures and we're just like trying to save the life and all that jazz. And then I've been involved like, with every single type of, uh, you could say, experience in law enforcement. A law enforcement officer anywhere in the United States that has probably been at the job for longer than 10 years, I've experienced everything within six months working in that city. So uh, after eight months, I remember my captain at that time, Sharon Williams. She was good. She she, She was good, folks. And she was like, hey, Paul, come over here man, you're doing good work. And uh, she, she would always say, it was funny, man, because at that time I'm young, I'm like, yeah. yes, ma'am, you know? Yeah. She'd be like, you do good work, bro. That's the way she would yeah. say it. And uh, I was just like, thank you, ma'am. She's like, you know what? You about to go to the gang unit. You about to do investigations because yeah. you know what? You good talker, you're smooth. And I was like, oh, okay, thank you, ma'am. Man, she, she, she put me in this investigation unit and these are all, we're talking about hitters. You know, like an entrepreneurship, we talk about uh, actual entrepreneurs that put the work. Yeah. You need discipline. Yeah. You need vision. Yeah. You need execution. Yeah. That's what it takes, right? Well, same thing with law enforcement. If it wasn't for law enforcement, I wouldn't be able to run a business today. I wouldn't have that leadership qualities. Yeah. Because what makes someone a good entrepreneur? Leading by example. Right. I'm able to, uh, today... I'm able to go to any one of my employees. I have a little bit over 30 employees. And I'm able to go every single one of them and actually give them an example of how their job should be done. Mm. So that's what it was in law enforcement. I had a mentor. At that time, I didn't have that mindset of, oh, this guy's my mentor. But realistically, people were taking me under the wing. And then I was able to progress and progress and progress. So after being in the gang unit, uh, doing a, a bunch of investigations, I ended up being voluntold to go to a special task force. This task force was made up of 13 agencies. They would send one detective from every police department. At that time, my police department was roughly over 800 officers. So I was picked out of the 800 officers to go to this task force on day one. They say they gave me an address, basically on a piece of paper. They were like, show up here at 6 a.m. in the morning. There's an operation you're going to be a part of, and that's your day one. Mm. Okay. 
take a <laughs> think about 21 Jump Street, bro. Yeah. All right, how they show up to that church, <laughs> and it's uh, it's Ice Cube over yeah. here as like the main yeah. dude. That's basically how it was. Yeah. I showed up and I was just like. What's going on here? What is yeah. going on here? And all I saw was like the FBI, the DEA, DOJ. We're talking about all the feds you could think about. It's like the movies. And I'm like, whoa. And I'm like a little bit over two years in law enforcement. I still had a baby face at that time. And everybody was like, who's this kid? Yeah. You know? And um, I oh, get- How old were you now? 24? <sighs> no, man. I was uh, 27. Okay. I was 27. So how and long you stayed that sales job? About five years? Uh, six years. Six years, okay. Yeah, so from 21 to about 26. Yeah, so Got about it. 26, man. So you, you start going up the ranks as a cop pretty fast now. Pretty fast. Yeah. And it's just because it's a very young department. Yeah. A lot of people that are first responders or in law enforcement, in order to get to that detective level, it's typically you got to put your time in. That's all it is. So it's like about 10 years. But being because it was that specific town that city and how you progress how you use your life experience uh to go and actually move ahead at a quicker uh, uh, pace you could say um th i mean that's what i had that, that was my advantage it was my communication skills yeah. so ultimately like instead of getting in physical altercations uh get into situations where i would have to use force or you know uh you know get physical with like a suspect or a crook nah man verbal judo you got to know how to talk to people, man, you know? And it's the same thing in entrepreneur. As an entrepreneur, if you know how to properly articulate yourself, communicate, guess what? You're about to make a lot of money. That's a fact. It's a fact. That's a big fact. Yeah. Hey, guys, sorry. We had to stop this episode. I don't know if you know what is about to happen right now. We always talk about when new opportunities come. We talk about getting ATM machines, right? You heard about that before. But I don't know if you heard about BTM machines, right? So one, I got to go and salute ATM together, Paul and their team, for blessing me with my own BTM that's now about to start generating me anywhere from five to $10,000 a month off of one single machine. Hit the link in the description below. We're going to literally give you guys the blueprint on how to help you get your own ATMs and your own BTM machines up and running, right? There's no one better in this space than ATM Together. Sign up so y'all can join an amazing program and an amazing opportunity to help you start generating more passive income. So, so what, because my thing, what, you know, we big on exposure. Like normally when you see it, it's possible. Yes. What, what may... How would you expose to this ATM thing, bro? Like, oh. yeah, tell me about that. Like, I want to know what was the the root of that because everybody got a root. Yeah, that was like, were you still you were still working at police? Like, what? Tell me about that. Yeah. <clears throat> so basically, to summarize my law enforcement journey, transition into ATMs, man. Um, I had got assigned to that task force. Mm -hmm. I did about three and a half years at that task force. It was. Uh, crazy fast as far as the experience that I was doing. I experienced a lot. We were taking down some of the biggest cartel members in the area. Uh, and we're talking about, we were confiscating like kilos of, of cocaine, heroin, meth um, on a weekly basis. Um, some of the biggest cases that I've ever seen where we were confiscating uh, close to a million dollars in cash mm -hmm. with uh, over about half a million dollars worth of meth. What y'all do with and, the cash though, bro? Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a lot of movies, bro. Where the cash be going, man? man? This ain't, this ain't uh, Street Kings, man. Yeah. <laughs> Blue Streak, all these <laughs> different movies. This ain't, ain't Trading Day. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Look, man. So <laughs> when law enforcement and those special task force, yeah. they always chase the money. Okay, yeah. there's a saying in law enforcement. And the reason why is because with larger narcotic traffickers or anybody doing like a uh, fraud. They always change the big players. They chase the big players. So we would do what is called acid and forfeiture. Mm. Acid and forfeiture is basically where they go ahead and they could tie the money to your illegal transactions. Mm. Okay. They're going to say like, well, this dude, I mean, yeah, he might have a couple of businesses here and there, but not enough to be making the millions that he does. So yeah. something's up, something's yeah. fishy. Yeah. And that's when they start investigating. It's a paper trail. Mm -hmm. So that's why you got to be good with being on point with articulating your reason why, especially when you go and you speak to like a judge that it's going to be, uh, authorizing like a search warrant to go and raid a house or whatnot where you suspect there's going to be hundreds of kilos of cocaine yeah. which happened you know on a weekly basis but yeah man yeah 
to so to to cut to the the ATM they, they portion. They got me excited for a second. <laughs> like, what are you doing with all this money, man? I, I, I could tell. <laughs> hey, man, whenever money comes out, we're like, what? Right. <laughs> so, all right. So to get to it, man. Um, <clears throat> I was doing the job. There was a situation where, and, and I have told this on on, on a few podcasts, but uh, it's a it's a very uh, key turning point in my law enforcement career where it was a case that was investigating this large narcotic trafficker out of L.A. And he was selling, I'm talking about kilos of coke in the Bay Area. And um, we had arrested him one time. The dude was out within two days. Wow. Like he was able to post, I think like his bail was like half a million dollars. Yeah. Was able to post it within a day. Yeah. We were like, no way, man. Yeah. So he got out. <clears throat> we still had an info on him. So we we tracked him to this hotel in in, in the area. And um, during our, you know, surveillance, you could say, um, we were seeing people going in and out of this hotel room. You know, we we had uh, we were able to stop a couple people on the way. We had probable cause to do that. And um, we caught a couple people with like uh, large amounts of heroin. And we're talking about what kilos yeah. we're not talking about little baggies kilos yeah. that are worth uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. <clears throat> and then. Finally, what what made us go, what? What is this guy doing? We had stopped somebody coming out the room with a backpack. He didn't have a backpack going in the room. Yeah. So he had a backpack coming out that had over like a quarter of a million dollars. Yeah. It was crazy. And I was like, okay, something's up. Yeah. So we were able to get a search warrant for that room. We were able to go in there. As we were going in, I was like the second person in, in line to go into the room. So we breached the room. The dude was in the bed. He was just chilling. And, uh, <laughs> Neil, you're, you're all like, man. Turn. You feel like it's a movie, bro. I mean, that's how it felt like, yeah. man. That's why the seven years in law enforcement it just went by so fast because, yeah. like, I was just like, man, what's going on? So we go in the room, and I remember my boy, he's just like, all right, dude, dude's on the right side of the, the room. So I look, and the guy's just like, his eyes just, people just went wide open. And he was like, whoa, I can't believe I'm getting hit again. Yeah. And he stands up, and the dude was actually doing powder, a powdered heroin. Yeah. Okay, they they call it uh, white china. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, <laughs> you sound like a movie, bro. All right. So he was doing powdered heroin. Well, at the time, the powdered heroin that he was doing, it was mixed with fentanyl. And oh, yeah. if you don't know what fentanyl is, fentanyl bad right now. It's taking people out of here. This is synthetic opiate that they mix that they cut with uh, with the drugs with heroin cocaine with everything and what they do this because it's a lower cost for them so then they could get a higher net profit yeah. you know yeah. <laughs> so then that's what he was doing he was used to it so his body was able to take that well I mean we, we don't use drugs so we got exposed to it because it was just in the air. Yeah. So think about it. All this powder heroin was yeah. in the air. It was like straight up movie. Yeah. So we get it on all of us, and I'm like, I'm all lightheaded. I'm like, oh man, what's going on? Yeah. Well, my my initial coworker who I got in, he got majority of it. He yeah. didn't notice it because yeah. we're we're all wearing like tack vests. All yeah. you know, you can't even tell it's us. Yeah. And uh, he's just like, hey man. He's like, Paul, I don't feel good. I was just like, dude, start taking off with your gear. So we start taking off your gear. Yeah. Dude turned blue. Yeah. Blue. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, like, what's going on? Luckily, I had just went to the DEA Academy. Yeah. They had trained me up on handling situations like that, hazardous situations like that when we're exposed to yeah. uh, opiates yeah. or fentanyl or anything like that. So at that time, they had administered um, Narcan. Narcan is basically like an antidote. It's an antidote that goes through a nasal spray, and you're able to revive anybody who has overdosed yeah. on an opiate. So uh, immediately, I was just like, hey, get the Narcan. And because yeah. it was so new, we yeah. just got trained up on it. We all had it in the car. Yeah. So this dude literally dropped within five seconds. Dude was, hands were blue. We thought he was dead. Yeah. Literally, like, all you can think about when you see somebody you're close with, you're like, wow, you think of all the good memories. Like in that, and it's seconds, Neil, yeah. seconds. And uh, I yell immediately, I was just like, hey, get the Narcan. And they run, they go get it. They get like about four uh, of those nasal spray antidotes. We spray them up and he just <gasps> comes back to life. Yeah. Comes back to life and I'm like, thank God. And they get the ambulance, they get them out of there. My lieutenant's like, you're in charge. Yeah. And I was one of the newest detectives. Yeah. And I was just like, I was like, you sure? I was like, yeah. I was like you sure? You sure? Yeah. I mean, it was my case, but still he's like, you're in charge. 
And it was just like, after that, like the respect level just went from here yeah, to here, yeah, literally, because yeah. they were like, man, you a player. Yeah, You're a hitter. Yeah. You know, and just because I, I in every niche and every job that I've ever done in my life, yeah. and it goes back to the very beginning when I was talking about my mother raising me to work hard, to, to go out there and get it. I've always been so independent. Yeah. I've always been a go-getter. I always said, hey, I always had the vision. And as long as you have the vision and the the drive and the discipline to do it that you could do anything yeah. no one can stop you that's a fact the only thing that's going to stop you in life is you. is you versus you so i mean that's the that's the the main thing that a good yeah. entrepreneur needs yeah. in anything they do and from that situation Man, I got accommodations. Uh, chief of police called me that scene. They're like, Paul, you okay? It was like Bad Boys 3, man. Yeah, yeah. They were like, Paul, you okay? You Mike Larry. Man, yeah. exactly. That's what they called me. Yeah. You know why? Because when I had started my ATM venture, like uh, like a year after that happened, I had pulled up on a brand new Porsche Panamera. Yeah. And they were like, dude, you can't afford that on a cop salary. I was just like, man, be cool. Like, yeah, yeah. I, it's not the cop salary. I have a side business. Yeah. And then that's when people started getting interested in what I was doing. But let's, let's fast forward to how I uh, actually found ATMs. Yeah. So after that whole situation, man, I was just like, okay, one, I, I was uh, going through a lot of, not therapy, but I was, uh, I was getting a lot of different injuries coming up. And I was still young, man. You know, at the time I, was, I had just turned 28 um, and I was already thinking, I was just like, there is no way I'm going to be able to survive here for another 25 years until I retire. Right. That's a there's, fact. There's no way. Yeah. Mentally, physically, and just spiritually, bro. Yeah. I was working 60 to 100 hour work weeks. It is not sustainable right. to work that much. Yeah. But majority of Americans do it. Yeah. Think about that. Yeah. Majority of Americans are relying on their nine to five right now. And they're working that much thinking that they're financially free. I was making a quarter of a million dollars working up to 100 hour work weeks thinking I was living the life. You was risking your life too though. Risking my yeah. life. I risked my Might personal be worse life. For you. <laughs> it was yeah. worse for yeah. me. But I didn't think about it like that, man, yeah. because here's the thing. Number 1, I didn't get into law enforcement for the money, right? And if people do with that intent, they're not going to last yeah. because honestly, it's like when people go to the military, it's when people become a doctor, when they become a nurse, doctors, they make a little bit over 300 K. But what people don't realize is the amount of time that doctors invest. Number one, going to school. What is it? More than 10 years at going least. into medical school yeah. at minimum. They're on call. They're on. And that's what I was going to get to. They're on call. So is it worth getting paid that much? If the only thing you're thinking about is, well, I just want to be a doctor to make 300K. No, you got to work smarter, not harder. So at the end of the day, you want to be financially free. You want to work for your money, but you want to expedite that process. You're able to enjoy your life. Because at the end of the day, here's the number one thing that struck me as I was going through the whole transition of my mindset shift was a critical incident or where you come from in your background usually determines whether or not you're going to go in business yourself. And it's a, it's a fact, you know, because if you're comfortable, you like what you do and you like who you work with and you make a sustainable amount of money, you're not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Majority of us are not going to go anywhere. That's just the way it is. Okay. Nothing pushes you yeah. to change your mindset. Well, number one, that incident changed my mindset right. because I was just like, you could have died. Well, not only could I have died, but it wasn't about me. It was about my coworker. Yeah. I was like, he almost died. Yeah. Well, that could have been you if you went in there first. It could have been me, right? But he had a family. He had kids. Actually, majority of the detectives that were my coworkers, they were 10 years older than me. Mm -hmm. Had kids, had a family. There'd be times where we would go raid a house, okay? We're talking about against cartel members that we knew were equipped with high-powered rifles, yeah. okay? Armories, dude. Yeah. Drugs. Money. We don't know who's in the house. I would see some of my coworkers shaking, bro. No lie. Yeah. 
And I'm over here like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. And it's just because at that time, I just had my girl. Of course, I had my family. But it's different when you have kids. Yeah. I mean, you talk about your kids all the time, yeah. right? So just th think about that, man. Think about if you had to do a job like that and you're yeah. risking your life. You're like, you're not just thinking about yourself. You're thinking about the kids. But with me, it was just like my mindset was just straight like, hey, I got a job to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do it, right? This dude's going to jail. It is what it is. It ain't personal. Yeah. So <laughs> with that being said, the shift, the shift, okay? So after thinking about all this, man, the incident, the injuries, the mindset, the fact that I had to work another 25 plus years till retirement, one of my trainers from Academy ends up dying. Mm. A heart attack six months after he retires. Crazy. Crazy, bro. How is it possible that you give your life to, I, I understand that majority of first responders they give their life because they're doing it for a better cause. They're doing it to help people that can't help themselves. That's ultimately what it is. It's like folks that go to the military. Mm -hmm. They're going to fight for everybody's freedom in the United States. But how is it that you retire and you can't even enjoy at minimum a whole year and then you croak out? Yeah. It's, it's actually a known fact, man. First responders, as soon as they retire, their level of adrenaline spikes all the way down. Yeah. Now they're living a normal life like everyone else. But here's the thing. When you're coming from a career like that where your adrenaline is up that high all the time because you gotta be, guess what? Your heart starts acting funny because it's not used to that. Right. So you that, die. And then you die. Yeah, yeah. I, I've seen that happen a lot to a lot yeah. of people. Man, I post that all the time on my yeah. IG. Yeah. I say, how is it possible? I was a cop. And they said you can retire. The average cop can only retire at like 59 now, yeah. right? Because they changed it from 50. But then the stats, it shows that they actually die around 59. That's Dude. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, they setting it up. They're saying it's a, it's a game. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. That doesn't make sense. So anyways, I told them, no, that's not going to be me. So uh, I figured out a way. I was like, you know what? What can I invest into as basically a side hustle? That yeah. was my mindset. That's it. A side hustle that's simple, that I can invest my money, that I worked hard for, that I had saved up, and go ahead and just start a business while I'm still working my nine to five because I was never comfortable just leaving my nine to five and yeah. starting a business. Yeah. I just, I don't agree with that, yeah. okay? Because now you're stuck in a hard place. Yeah. Now it, it gotta happen or it gotta yeah. happen, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so with that, man, Got into ATMs. Um, had a buddy that I had spoken with. He actually was researching ATMs, you know, for how long? About four years. Wow. Never started. Wow. He told me about it. Got the idea that day. I bought a book on Amazon on how ATMs work. Executed a week after. Started going, uh, landed about six locations myself. Yeah. I just threw on the old suit that I had before I was a cop. Yeah. And uh, land the locations, connected with a manufacturer mm -hmm. that uh, at that time didn't give me. So, so what we doing right now? Because I want to catch this, and I want people to get it. this. Where this uh, this the masterclass part. So sure. step one, get a book. But step one would be to get your book or get whatever that you do showing people. But the first thing was you acquired the book. The next thing was you buy the do you buy the machine first or you get the location first. I want somebody to be able to go do this stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'll break it down, man. I mean, the first thing you should do is due diligence. So yeah. do your research. Yeah. You know, like I have a uh, free Facebook group. Yeah. I have uh, close to 60,000 members in there in the past two years. It's called ATM Business for Beginners. Yeah. Just go on Facebook and you could actually, mm -hmm. actually just put ATM Business where the first thing that pops up. Yeah. Uh, the second thing I would recommend people to do is check out, we have a free ebook. Yeah free book on ATMs, uh, automated teller machines, and then BTMs. And that's actually one of the newest offers that we're offering right now at my company, ATM Together. And it's called uh, Bitcoin Teller Machines. Yeah. And I'll get into that in just a bit. Yeah. But <clears throat> with that, the free ebook basically shows you the basics, gives you a little bit of background on us, how we started, and basically how we can help you become successful in the ATM industry. Now, from there, we actually have a free mini course, and then we have a ton of 
live trainings, replays as well. And we also have a YouTube channel now. You know, just put ATM together on all the platforms and you, everything will come up. Yeah. You know, so due diligence first. Number one, research, yeah. right? Yeah. Hey, you're looking at this and you're probably enjoying this episode and the strategies and the gems that I give you. This is just a fraction of what you learn in my mastermind, right? I would love for you to be able to learn more information on how he's able to help Carter Cofield make a million dollars in one single day, how he's able to help Rochelle Parks make over $500,000 in a day, learn how he's able to help Tevin grow his Instagram following from 70,000 followers to upwards to 200,000 followers within two months. And again, those results Thoughts are not typical, let me be very clear, but they are possible for those who are willing to put work in, energy, and effort. If you're looking at this video right now, I want you to go to the website mastermindwithneo.com so you can apply to see if you're a good fit for a mastermind. This is specifically for someone looking to grow their digital business, right? Even though, y'all probably even know David Shan, Sleep is for Suckers, he's inside of my mastermind. You probably know Sonya, the student loan doctor, he's inside of my mastermind. You probably know Darius Daniels, he's inside of my mastermind. Those are just a few more people who are absolutely crushing it as a result of being inside of the community. So listen, if you're looking at this, right, and you're probably looking at the episode like, man, you're dropping so much gems but can you imagine how many gyms you'll get when you're actually inside of the environment, when you're tapped into the community? What I want you guys to go to right now is mastermindwithneo.com so you do not miss out on your opportunity to get tapped in. You will have to apply, you will have to get on the call, and hopefully you make the cut to be a part of what we got going on. I'll see you on the inside. Let's get back to the episode. Number two, let's say if you currently have about $7,000 and you're strapped for cash and you need a side hustle yeah. and you have a little bit of time yeah. because when you start your own business, it's either going to be, you're gonna give up time or you're gonna invest a little bit more. That's yep. just the way it goes, right? Yep. So with that being said, I would go ahead and find a manufacturer and you could do this by just typing in Google yep. ATMs. Yep. You'll see a lot of different vendors on there. Do your due diligence, get three bids, yep. okay? You'll get the three bids. Once you get the three bids, Go ahead and determine. What's a bid? Like bidding for a machine? Three bids, so basically getting the price All right, got it. on okay. the actual machines. Okay. Typically, your average ATM right now, which it could be a Gen Mega yeah. G2500 okay. or a Hyosun Halo 2. Those are some of the best standard ATMs that you could buy out there. Um, they usually run around $2,300, okay, especially in 2023. Uh, with shipping across the United States, you're probably looking around $2,500, okay? So, so I can get my first machine, $2,500. $2,500. Yeah. I would recommend starting out with about two to $3,000 yeah. inside of the actual machine. Cash. Cash, Got it. Okay. okay? So you need that much cash to actually make your operation work, okay? And then I would have about $1,000 for miscellaneous. We're yeah. talking about filing your LLC, yeah. EIN, going ahead and actually getting an internet modem, yeah. and then any additional paperwork that you might need. An ATM sign that costs about 50 bucks. So all in, if you are realistically trying to start your own ATM business, I would say roughly around 7,000 should be sufficient. Should I start with one, one machine or two? It depends on what how much money you got. Yes, it all depends on how much money you got, but at the end of the day, you always want to see if any industry is for you. So before yeah. you go all in, go ahead and test the waters. Yeah. You know, see how it is, see how you like it, yeah. okay? See if it makes because, sense. See if it makes sense, yeah. because at the end of the day, it may not be for you. My vehicle that made me a multimillionaire may not be the vehicle that gets you to be a multimillionaire. Yeah. You know, you have to experience. I've been a serial entrepreneur for more than 10 years. Yeah. At the end of the day, I could tell you I tried everything. Yeah. For a lot of people, Amazon automation worked, right? Yeah. For me, it didn't. I actually right. lost twice. So right. Amazon automation, it is what it is. But the key thing is with the $7,000 startup uh, for the person that has about $7,000, you're going to have to find your own location. Mm -hmm. Location is everything, just like event spaces, yeah. just like vending machines, just like any other uh, tangible business out there. Uh, finding the location is key. So a couple of great tips that I would recommend when you go find locations is look for tourist area in your city. Mm -hmm. Join the actual uh chamber of commerce in yeah. your city as well. Sure. Networking with other small business owners will help you go ahead and actually land more deals than anything else. The reason why I was able to land an assortment, basically a whole fleet of 
dispensaries, which is one of the highest, you could say the golden goose in the ATM industry. So look for a dispensary, people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, especially in your state. Especially states it. once soon as they start opening. Them. Correct, because yeah. they're always looking. Yeah. And then if you see them uh, starting to do the construction phase of it, usually they'll have a sign out there. But if you go to the Chamber of Commerce, they'll actually tell you ahead of time what new businesses are opening uh, the, the next month yeah. or uh, uh, the upcoming months. Yeah, so good. if you go out there, you get that information first and then you're able to contact them right away because they usually have the owner's information yeah. the other big thing is linkedin linkedin is huge mm. if you're using social media use social media to your advantage it is the strongest communication tool out there you got to think about it back in the day man about 15 years ago we didn't have access to the general public like we do now yeah. now That's any fair. any average american okay i'm an average guy i'm able to go ahead and and play with the big boys, yeah. right? Because we have access to social media. We're able to buy ad, ad uh, space. We're yeah. able to uh, run uh, our actual advertisement in these big pages yeah. on social media that have millions of followers and be exposed, right? So at the end of the day, make sure that you're very creative with uh, trying to network so you're able to land these locations for your ATM. High traffic location, visible location, of course, cash driven. Uh, at the end of the day, just because they have a credit card machine, it doesn't mean that location's out. You have to see what specifically they are selling. Liquor stores are a great location for ATMs, nail salons, barber shops. There's so many different locations that you guys can use. Let me ask you, Paul, why, sure. why, why would somebody let me put my machine in? What do I gotta give to that, give to them? Am I giving them a piece of what I'm making? Mm -hmm. Somebody able to walk me through that process. Great question. So this is probably one of the biggest objections that everybody gets because people are like, well, all the great locations already have ATMs. But here's the thing, guys. There are millions of businesses that open every single day is number one. Number two, you also have to consider just because there's an ATM there, the service may not be great. Maybe the owner of that business, that merchant, is actually looking for a brand new ATM deployer, just like yourself that is hungry, driven, and wants to provide great customer service. So if you go in there and you offer your services and you possibly tell them, hey, look, I will never let that ATM run dry so then your business can run efficiently, hey, they're gonna take you up on that contract. I've gotten in contact many times where the owner just wanted me to actually load the cash in the ATM, his ATM, and then I was able to offer him one of my machines, replace the ATM, actually buy it from them, and then refurbish it and sell it myself. But now I'm making the actual residuals off of that account because I offered my services to him, at the level of customer service, and guess what? What helped me in law enforcement, helped me in entrepreneurship, what? Communication. Yeah. Communication is everything. Communication is everything. Communication is everything. People yeah. have to like you. People yeah. are not buying your services, guys. Whatever niche you're in, whether it's real estate, you know, B to, uh, B, B to C, it doesn't matter. Digital marketers, because I know we've got a lot of digital marketers yeah. that are watching this. You have to be able to communicate effectively. Okay. So if you're not good on camera, you're not good at talking to people, you're not a public speaker, guess what? You're doing yourself a disservice. You're leaving money on the table if you're not going ahead, taking some classes, joining a group where you're able to articulate yourself, yeah. public speaking, all that jazz. Okay? You know what I used to do? I used to do Toastmasters. Oh, you did? Yeah, I did nice. Toastmasters. Yeah. And I just practiced by just doing it. That's the best way I feel like doing things sometimes. Just do the thing. That's it. Yeah. And, and how big of a social proof and authority is it to go and replay some of your old videos yeah. and to see where you started from, Oh, man? geez. Dude, it's, it is crazy. I remember I used to be like- It's bad for me though. Yeah. I'm like, Ugh. Yeah, I used to- stutter all the time like la, 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 la. Yeah, like you know yeah. like oh, me too yeah sweat yeah. and like be tripping out and yeah. yeah it's insane but everybody's oh you're such a natural and yeah. dude but you guys haven't seen how many times i've failed yeah. to become unnatural yeah right and you have to do the reps yeah. you have to do the reps so to continue with the atm business now let's say you don't have a lot of time yeah okay and uh you want more of a passive income type of deal, like a business in a box. Yeah. That's what my company specializes in. Yeah. So we basically build ATM businesses across the nation. We uh, Right now we're climbing a little bit over 1,800 clients in the past two years wow. nationwide uh, with ATMs. But now our new offer that we started offering about three months ago, BTMs, mm. that's Bitcoin that. Teller Machines. Tell now, me how this work too, because I still, <laughs> I, I go in the supermarket, I see the Bitcoin, like I'm like, is a, I know a, a coin ain't gonna come up, but tell, how does a Bitcoin machine work? Bro? It's it's why do I need it? It's it's crazy, man, because a lot of people are like, crypto, yeah. Bitcoin, yeah. 
Yeah. Like, no. It's I'm, over with right I'm now. I'm not yeah. comfortable. It's over with. Look what's happening to the banks. Look, look what's happening to all the trading platforms online. Yep. Well, let me tell you something. This is why it is the perfect time to invest into BTMs. And the reason why I actually got into it because my eyes got wide open as soon as everything started happening as far as uh, the trading platforms getting uh, shut down. Like uh, I ended up losing, I don't know if I told you, man, I ended up losing like around $60,000 uh, when BlockFi crashed. And the only reason why I was able to lose, uh, the reason why I lost that much on BlockFi is because their platform actually takes about a few days to transfer the money to your bank account. Yeah. So during the time that I was getting my funds transferred to my bank account, they go bankrupt. Yeah. And guess what happens to everyone's funds? The millions of dollars, the hundreds of millions of dollars that they had in their system, their ecosystem, gone. Wow. Now I'm in a lawsuit. Yeah, I'll get it back, but it's just the energy that I have to waste on that, right? Now with BTMs, it's a tangible machine that you go in there you can easily download what we call a hot wallet. The hot wallet is basically a very small application that you keep your digital currency, which is your Bitcoin in it, okay? It's a basically a barcode, a QR code, and you scan it on the machine, you scan your ID, and you put your cash in there. Now, guess what? Wait, one more time. You you say that part again, I wanna make sure. You scan the hot jar, hot bar. The, the, the hot wallet. Hot wallet, go ahead, say it one more time, because I wanna make sure I court that. Yeah, the hot wallet. Yeah. You scan it on, tell me that part. So you scan it. The process of using a BTM is you scan your hot wallet, which is a QR code on your phone. Okay. It. So it goes directly to your phone. And then from there, you go ahead and scan your actual ID, whether it's a passport or your state ID, and then you can enter your cash. Okay. You enter your cash and then it will transfer to whoever you're trying to send it to. This is great because when you think about it like this, if you have family in another country, okay, I have family in Peru, I have family in Mexico, guess what? The United States is one of the last countries to implement BTMs. Mm. Across the world, they're already out there. So instead of using Western Union, getting your money tied up five to 10 days, guess what? Just you send it to the hot, to the, to the wallet. That's it. You send it wow. to the wallet, bro. Damn. So you use that the machine. Sense. You use the machine. You <clears throat> sent the money. Boom. They get it right away. Your mom, your grandma, they instantly have it. Yeah. And guess what? Yeah. You own the machine. You're not buying the crypto. Yeah. You're not putting the cash in there. Mm. You're a broker. Wow. That's all you are. You're a middleman. Yeah. So and I'm getting paid off of every transaction? You're getting paid off of every transaction, my friend. Ooh. Roughly 10% of a Bitcoin. So think about it right now. Bitcoin is roughly 20K what? 20K now? It's about 20K right now. So you get 10% of that. What's 10% of that? Uh, $2,000. $2,000. Imagine if you only sell two Bitcoins a month. Yeah. It's four grand. So, so just so I'm getting it right. So my machine, I had 10 people come up and everybody that came up, they all sent $2,000. So I get 10% of how, whatever that machine does in a month. Correct. So my sh is a possibility that a machine could do 10 Bitcoins in a month. Oh yeah, and we, and we do. We have some locations where mm. the actual BTM owner is making $21,000 net. A month? A month, but it ranges. Okay? So, so where are the most popping locate? Like where would I put one of these at? <laughs> <laughs> you know? anywhere, anywhere where you would consider a high traffic area, but to be honest- Can we put some these of out the, front of our event spaces? Of course, you could do ATMs, you could do BTMs, and then I have a new venture that actually just came out about a month ago, which I think this will have to be for our next episode. It's, uh, it's called Cash Discount, what has to do with credit card machines, okay? Mm -hmm. But we'll, we'll talk about that in another episode. But to, to, to go with the BTMs, yeah, when we did the conference last year, the Passive Income Conference, yeah. right? Yeah. We had told the valet guy, we were like, hey man, because they only accept the cash. Yeah. Like, where's your ATM over here? He's just like, oh, I don't got one. I was just like, you need a mobile ATM. That's the thing. So think about it like this. Say your audience has multiple event spaces, yeah. right? Yeah, talk, so, talk to me about how can I help so, them make some so, more bread, so this, bro? So this is how you can make some money if you have multiple event spaces. Or let's say you have a connection with either merchants, business owners, whoever. Well, mobile ATMs. 
These ATMs, they can work off of the Wi-Fi. Yeah. So you can move it. You can actually, it's a 200-pound machine. It takes two people. You can load it up to your actual vehicle. It'll fit in a Prius. Yeah. It's not that yeah. big. But at the end of the day, you can take out the cash, load up the cash when you're at the event, make your money, make it a cash only, like at the bar, whether you're going to do soft drinks, water, or alcohol. Yeah. And there you go. You just made another stream of income wow. besides what you're making at the event space that day. Yeah. So it's a win-win for everybody and it's a very low investment when you think about it you're only spending roughly around 23 to 2500 dollars on the actual machine yeah. the cash that you're using you can put it back in your in your account after you're done using it for that event yeah. so roughly i mean it's it's a no-brainer how much is the uh btm machine so, so btms btms right now they roughly run around fifteen thousand yeah. dollars but what we offer at ATM together, okay, we offer like a done for you, okay, like a business in a box. So the way we, we do it is we get you the actual BTM, one BTM, we give you the location. We actually have armored vehicle services that will load up the machine for you if needed. So you don't got to put your own money. And I actually put my crypto in your machines. So wow. here's the great thing about this. We don't actually get paid off of the actual uh, startup fees for this. No, we don't make any money off of this. What we make the money is on the residuals. So you, as the business owner, you're the broker, okay? That's your machine, yeah. you're the BTM owner, okay? We'll manage everything for you, just like if you were to get, uh, you know, like it says, beautiful Airbnb, man, get, get a nice little, you know, property and then have a management team do it, right? Yeah. Same thing, yeah. we're the management team for your BTM. Yeah. You get your 10% cut, so you got the residuals coming in monthly, and then we're charging the clients 15%, so we get 5%, you get 10%. That's the way it works. So we only make money when you make money. So our success is your success. I, I like them models, because it's like, yo. It have to, we're incentivized. Yeah. It's a no-brainer. It makes me want to go do the work. Of course. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's really no. I think no, I gotta no get me to a it. couple BTM machines. Oh, don't worry, man. We're, I need a couple. We're, of them. we're we're gonna definitely talk about yeah, that. Yeah, I need, I need a couple of them. I need them at the. It's because I've been going in the supermarkets, bro. I've been seeing them. They're like big yellow machines. I guess they vary in color, but it's like we got a few yellow ones. I mean, do you put you don't put cash in them too, or can it do both or no? So that's a great question. Yeah. Actually, I got one of my warehouses out here in Atlanta. Yeah. And I stopped by yesterday and we were actually talking about that. Yeah. Some of the biggest manufacturers in the ATM industry right now are working on integration with BTM machines and cash ATM machines. Yeah. And they're coming out in the next few months. Yeah. Well, we're going to be the, you could say we're not as big as these manufacturers because they're international, but we're going to be one of the main players in that game. We're already working on our uh, prototype and we're going to be coming out that with that in the next six months as well. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. So it's going to be good. Hey, I'm excited for you, man. Well, look, Thanks, congrats, bro. bro. I'm super grateful that you came on the episode just to share. Like, I, my biggest thing is uh, Warren Buffett says, um, if you don't find a way to make money in your sleep, you will work until you die, right? Absolutely. One of the things I always say is having one, one source of income is too close to none, right? So yeah. it is so powerful that it's so many, because honestly, I, I've seen what, you, what you've done with ATMs. I've seen the clients of mine that you help make money. Absolutely. And uh, I'm like, man, is it still money being made in this industry? Ooh, and this, the yeah. thing is, it's so, I thought about when I was at a festival, bro, they had 10 machines lined mm -hmm. up outside and the lines were through the roof. So it was like, there's so many ways to make money. And that's my goal with our, our channel and our platform is to keep showing people, because event spaces may not be for them, yeah. right? ATMs Absolutely. might be their might be their way out. Uh, BTMs might be their way out, and I'm talking about you could make a two thousand, a ten thousand, a twenty thousand a month off of one machine. Yeah, and you only got to do the work once, and then your team help place it. That's it. I feel like it's a no brainer. So I, again, I'm grateful. We're gonna make sure we leave links for everybody to get everything, but just let everybody know how they could connect with you, everything you got right now, so they know. Yeah, absolutely, guys. So you guys can connect with me on Instagram. That's going to be Paul Alex Espinoza. Also, check out the main website, www.atmtogether.com. And also, check us out every single Tuesday, 5 p.m. Pacific Central Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, ATM Business for Beginners on Facebook, the largest ATM, BTM Facebook group on the internet. Okay, guys? And check us out once again 
on YouTube. Just type in ATM together. We have hundreds. We just hit our 10,000 follower, $10,000 or 10 K follower mark on YouTube within two months, guys. Congratulations. Uh, Thanks brother. And uh, it's going to be good. So we got some good things coming up guys. Yeah. And this is what I want to say. If y'all looking at this video, I want y'all to join me on the journey. I'm not telling y'all go get BTMs and ATMs and I don't do it. Paul going to go get me. I'm getting me one to two BTMs, maybe one for each of my children. That's right. So I think we need four. Let's do it. And I want y'all to join the journey with me. So if y'all joining the journey with me in the notes, in the comments, say I'm joining y'all and make sure y'all click that link below so y'all can go in and schedule a call with their team to see how they can help you. So with that being said, bro, thank you for tapping into the episode, man. Wish you the best with everything you got going on. Absolutely, bro. Let's get it, bro. Thank you. Let's get it. Thank you.